Well, hey there, everyone. I'm Daniel Hahn, and I'm the online campus pastor here at Oxford Assembly of God Church, and this is our podcast. And I just want to thank you for listening today. We hope the message you're about to hear inspires you, builds your faith, and helps you see that God has a purpose for your life. And now, let's get into the message. Until recently, I never compared the book of Malachi with the book of 2 Peter. But when I was doing some of my studies and, and, and prophets, I, I run across something and said, man, this is pretty neat. And the more I dug into it, the more I realized that what Malachi is in the Old Testament, Second Peter is to the New Testament, talking about some of the same things. So I began to think about it and the, and the relationship of an old saying. Maybe you've heard it. It's the same song, but a different verse. Have you heard that? You haven't. Man, I got to go back and get a new title. That messed me up. Peter mentioned the prophets and their impact. Second Peter chapter 1. And we're going to be a flip-flopping back between Second Peter and Malachi. And, of course, one scripture in Hebrews. But let's begin by Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19. But before we read it, let's have a word of prayer. Father God... Thank you for this great group of people that are assembled together. We thank you for those that are watching online. God, we know that your word is true, and we know that your word will never return void. We may mess up sharing it. We may mess up printing it. We may do all kind of things, but your word will accomplish what it set out to accomplish. So we ask you, Lord, to do that today. Let our hearts be receptive. Let our minds be receptive. Let us hear what you would say to the church today, and we give you praise for it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen and amen. So 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 and verse 20, it says, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in our hearts knowing this first of all that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit we find that uh, Peter refers back to a, a reference over in the book of Malachi. And we know that the impact of the scripture of Malachi. And we need to understand something that in the Bible, how many knows that the Bible is a love story? It's all about love. It's all about love. For God so loved the world. So if we go along with this thought and this theme that uh, it's the same song but a different verse, we're going to look at four different verses, but I want you to know that the course of the song is Jesus loves me, this I know. Jesus loves me, this I know, because that's what the whole Bible is all about. And Malachi puts it this way in chapter 4, verse 2, Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, it says, But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. That was a reference that Peter made to the book of Malachi. He was talking about that. The, the situation is this. My, the advantage we have over Malachi is we got the whole book. Malachi only had the law. He only knew what God told him to write. And as the last book in the Old Testament, he began to write some prophecy that was talking about the coming of the Messiah. I mean, knows what was going to happen very shortly after he wrote that book. You got it, nothing. Y'all answered that one right on, the, right on the head. You got it right. That's, man, you're, what, one, one out of two, that's not bad. Nothing for 400 years. Silence. But we not only have the law in the Old Testament, we have the New Testament to guide us. And we have an advantage over Peter. We've had 2,000 years of experience, 2,000 years of story, things that we can observe and see. So as we go along with this thought, a same song but different verse. 
I was thinking again that the whole Bible is just a love story. The love of God, so rich and true. And what better weekend to preach this than on Valentine's Sunday? As we talk about Jesus loves. How many knows that these two books were full of rebuke? Did you know that? How many's got the hearing aid turned on? <laughs> I, I'm just checking. Huh? Well, I, I, I know Gator's been sick and he's going to sleep. I can understand he's got an excuse. Why are the rest of you? Okay. Let's wake up. It says that the, Malachi chapter 1 verse 2 sums it up. Notice that one verse. He says, I have loved you. Aren't you glad that Jesus loves you? Aren't you glad that God loves you? And the theme of the Bible is Jesus loves me. This I know. But in the Bible, we know that there is rebuke and correction. The theme of the Bible is Jesus loves me. So if you get nothing else, I want you to know that Jesus loves you. But how much does he love you? That's a good question. Say, well, he loved me enough to die for me. How many thinks that's worth? That's a lot of love. I love a lot of you, but I'm going to tell you what, it'd be rough for me to die for you. Huh? It would. And I'll tell you what would be harder. It'd be much harder for me to send my son to die. Or one of my grandkids to die. I think I could do it for you. But I couldn't give one of them. I'd say, take Gator. <laughs> huh? Hey, Gator would do the same thing. He wouldn't tell you. He said, you're not going to take one of my kids. Take the pastor. He's the one that's guilty. He's the one that caused all this mess. But God loved us. But he loved us more than just to die for us. You say, more than love to die for us? Yeah, he loved us so much that he would discipline us. That he would correct us. Now let's go to Hebrews and read a couple of verses in chapter 13. Excuse me, chapter 12, verse 3. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin... You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, have you? I haven't. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not light, right, regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when repro reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the ones he loves. That's how we know that Jesus loves us. He disciplines us. And if you're just a spoiled brat, I have to wonder, does Jesus love you as much as he does me? Because I've been disciplined. I know I've been corrected, and that's Malachi, and Peter does a lot of that. He says, but he chastises every son whom he receives. Why? Because he wants you to be better than what you used to be. He wants you to be better than who you were. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. See, that's how you know your sons. I said, that's how you know your sons, because he disciplines you. Now, I'm back from old school. I remember that if you went to grandma's house, she considered your son too. <laughs> and your uncle's house, he considered your son too. But the reality is we're considered sons of God. If you're left without discipline, Excuse me. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you're left without discipline in which all have participated, then you're all illegitimate children and not sons. Wow. Aren't you glad you're a son of God? Aren't you glad he loves you? Amen. Aren't you glad he loves you enough to discipline you? Amen. See, God loves us. So what is the song of Malachi and 2 Peter sound like? Again, the chorus is, Jesus loves me, this I know. When we think of Malachi, what comes to mind? 
Y'all miss that one? <laughs> Tithing. You know that. I'm going to have to give an open book test next week. <laughs> Malachi. We talk about tithing. God calls it robbing from God if you don't tithe. Now, I know this is where it gets real quiet. If it gets any quieter, I'm going to go to sleep. You know, the, the worst nightmare a pastor ever has is to dream that he's preaching and goes to sleep and then wake up and find out it was true. That's a nightmare. See, Peter uses the terminology, they follow the ways of Balaam. What did that signify? Greed. Greed. Now, I know none of you are affected by it, but I've heard that there are some people that are affected by greed. Wanting to hold that and hold on to that that really doesn't belong to them. And I know some of you say, well, Pastor, if you mention tithing, I don't believe in tithing. That's fine. You may not believe in electricity, but don't grab two live wires and hold on to them. Because whether you believe it or not, it's going to find out that you were wrong. Let's read Second, uh, Peter chapter 1, verse 14 and 16. Chapter 2. No wonder I couldn't find it. That's the wrong chapter. They have eyes full of adultery and satchable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. Now see, Hebrews, I mean, excuse me, Timothy said the root of all evil is the love of money. Not money. Not money. So you can give me all the money you have. It's, that's not wrong. But the lust of money, the love of money, or greed. He says, they entice and steady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. Accursed children. Or in other words, accursed children is not the Ones that God loves are adopted. He calls them sons of God. Forsaking the right way, they've gone astray. They'll follow the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing. So we understand, it goes, go on to verse 16, but was rebuked for his own transgressions. A speechless, speechless donkey spoke with human voice and retained the prophet's madness. Re, restrained the prophet's madness. That's amazing thought. Because God talks about giving. Now, I don't like to use the word tithing myself. You know what I like a lot better? First fruits. First fruits, because that's an Old Testament concept that carries over to the New Testament. You say, Bible, the New Testament doesn't say about first fruits. Yes, it says that Jesus was the first fruits. You and I, the, the ones that followed, the first fruits. Now, where do you get that from? Well, go back with me to Malachi chapter 1. Now, those of you that are tightened up because of the giving, we're going to get off that real soon. But chapter 1, verse 6. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where's my honor? And if I'm a master, where's my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priest. Or excuse me, O priest who despise my name. But you say, how we despise your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals and sacrifices, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? Now, let me just ask you. I know you, everybody's looking for April the 15th, so we'll be able to send our offering to, up to uh, Washington. I mean, we all look forward to that. Now, let me just recommend you go out to your pasture and find a cow with cancer eye or find one that's starving to death or find one that's crippled. And you send it paper clip to your tax form and say, this is my offering. You say, that's silly. That's what it's talked about. He said, who would have you offer a crippled animal to the governor? Who would you offer something secondary? Now, I know some of you say, what are you talking about? I'm just telling you, 
we don't need to give God our junk. We need to give him our first fruits. Because there's one place that God will not be in that second place. It's clear throughout the Bible. That is a, a, is a truth. We don't give God leftovers. We don't give him. And now go on and say, well, yeah, well, you give that to the governor. If the governor, or, let me rephrase that because you might not like the governor. Uh, what if somebody that you really, really, really thought highly of and you really wanted to impress him, whether it be the president, governor, County commissioner, ditch digger, it doesn't matter. But if you wanted to impress them, wouldn't you pick the best of your flock? I know we used to have to go out and kill a chicken. And I guarantee you, or chickens, because there were seven of us kids, nine of us, it took more than a chicken just to feed us. But if we had somebody coming special, we wouldn't want to give them a sick animal. We would want to give them the best, particularly if it's somebody we really loved. Now, let's go and look at this over in Second Peter chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. Let's try chapter 1, verse... Okay, let, let's drop down to first, uh, 13 and 14 of chapter 1 of Malachi. Excuse me. But you say, what a weariness. This is, and you snort at it, says Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame and sick, and then you bring it as an offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king. Oh, wait a minute. You were going to give the governor the best and the great king your leftovers? I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. That's verse 1. You didn't like it. But the course is Jesus loves me. This I know. So what's verse 2? Next verse might be called patience and waiting. Now, does anybody besides me have problems with patience? Now, I want you to know I'm not going to pray for patience because I found out that patience comes from problems. But I have to struggle with patience. See, after the book of Malachi, what happened? I already said it. You got it right a while ago. Nothing. 400 years of silence. Malachi was projected and talking about the Messiah was coming, but 400 years and they heard nothing. They were waiting for the coming Messiah. By the time Jesus was born, 400 years later, even though they were saying they were waiting for the Messiah, most had lost hope or placed their hope elsewhere. I said, most had lost hope or placed their hope elsewhere. Before I go any further, let me put this in here. See, people ask me, Pastor, I believe in missions, but why do we, why do we make such a big issue of missions? Why is Oxford consumed about missions? Because it's all about Christmas. You say, Christmas? Yeah. See, Malachi said, a Messiah is going to be born. 400 years of nothing, they were waiting for it. But when it happened, they didn't even know it. Christmas showed up and only a handful of people realized it. Did you know that many of us here in this building are patiently waiting for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? And many in the world don't know he's come the first time. They haven't been told that Jesus is Messiah. 
They've never heard of Jesus. And how can I wait patiently for the Lord to come the second time when there are people that don't know he came the first time? It's just all about Christmas, knowing that Jesus came. You see, while we the church wait for Jesus, many people don't even know he's been here yet. See, just like Malachi's generation, I believe we too have grown impatient in waiting. You may disagree with me, but I think it's true for me sometimes. I say I'm waiting for the rapture, but I don't act like I'm waiting for the rapture. Those in Jesus' generation, they said they were waiting for the Messiah, but he showed up and they didn't even know it. Lived with them for 33 years and many, many, many never knew that he was existed, yet they'd been waiting on him. I believe we too have gone impatient waiting for the Messiah. What did Peter say in chapter 3, verse 8? Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Now, did you catch that? It says, we worry about the time. We say, well, when's it going to happen? What's going to happen? The reality is, with God... There's no such thing as time. I, I said, with God, there's no such thing as time. You can't relate to that. Okay, with God, uh, with, how many knows with your wife, there's no such thing as time when you take her and drop her off at a certain store? <laughs> huh? What do you, what wives, I, I want to be fair. How many knows for the husband there's no such thing as time when you drop him off at Bass Pro and give him unlimited money? How many would like to go to Bass Pro and with, a, with a blank check? Huh? Some of you be there for a few days, right? You'd be there. Yeah, we, why? Because we'd love to shop there. But with God, there's no such thing as time. I said there's no such thing as time. He's eternal. So one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. So we get tired of waiting and that's okay. But while we're waiting, we need to remember. Jesus loves me. This I know. Because it's a challenge to, to wait on the Lord. We have to have patience in waiting. You don't like that verse either. Verse 3. The next verse is the challenge to live godly. I know some of you saying, Pastor, you're going downhill. The challenge to live godly. Because remember, Malachi and Second Peter were written to the, at the end of their time frame. They were written before the Old Testament ended. 400 years of silence. Then Peter wrote right near the end of the, of, of the New Testament saying, Jesus is going to come back. But until then, you got to have patience in waiting. And the patience and the challenge to live godly. I know somebody say, I don't know if I agree with that. Well, let's see what the book says. Go to Malachi chapter 3, verse 16, 18. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them, and a book of remembrance was written before him of who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord, and the day when I make up my treasured possessions, and I will spare them as a man spares 
his son who serves him. Then once more, you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve God. How about what does, what does 2 Peter say about living godly? 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Verse 11. Since all these things are to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the God, because of which heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we're waiting for the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. We need to understand something that we're living in difficult times and yet God says, I want you to wait patiently for the coming and I want you to wait godly. How many of you know that it's hard to live for God? I can tell you, it's not hard, it's impossible without God. All of our efforts, all of our labors, all of our works is as filthy rags. And you say, well, why does God want you to live holy? Why does he tell you to live holy and live godly if, if, if it's that hard? Because he wants us to depend upon him, not depend upon ourselves. We know he loves us. We know he cares for us. We know he disciplines us. I said, we know God disciplines us. Why? Because he loves us. So there's a challenge to live godly. I'm glad we don't have to just stop with the challenge because I tell you, as I've already said, it's impossible to live a godly life. It's only God lives in us and through us. But that brings us to the last verse, God's deliverance. I said God's deliverance. Malachi chapter 4, 1 and 3 for behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evil doers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But, aren't you glad there's some buts in the Bible? But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings, you shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. I, one of these days, it's all going to uh, culminate. One of these days, it's all going to be finished, and God's going to come get us. But I want to tell you something. Until then, he wants us to live a godly life. Until then, he wants us to be dependent upon him. Until then, he wants us to wait patiently. Until then, he wants us to be involved in missions and giving because there's people that need to know about Jesus Christ. Until then, we've got work to do. Until then, he's going to be disciplining you. Come on, turn there. Thank you, Lord. I don't know about you. Some of you, we, we all grew up differently. But if I think if my dad was still alive... And I did something he wouldn't like, he'd still want to discipline me. Why? Because he loved me. He cared for me. He wants me to do the right thing. But we got God's deliverance. I'm going to carry on for that in a minute, but just to let me remind you the first fruits, this first verse. Let's give him what belongs to him. Patience and waiting is the second verse. A challenge to live godly is the third verse. And the chorus is, oh, how I love Jesus and Jesus loves me. 
But then the fourth verse is God's deliverance. God's deliverance. See, we have it so much better than Malachi. I said we have it so much better because we have the Holy Spirit. I thought Lee was going to get on my sermon early when he's talking about we need the Holy Spirit. And what he said about he needed the Holy Spirit to get out of bed, I heard that a little bit differently. Some people said, asked the pastor, said, Do I need the Holy Spirit to get to heaven. And the pastor said, I need the Holy Spirit to get to Walmart. <laughs> See, Peter understood something. I can relate to Peter. How many of you can relate to Peter? Peter was one of those open mouth, insert foot. I can relate to that. He was quick to promise something they weren't quite capable of living up to. But by the time he learned this, he, he, he heard something. He knew something. Let's see what it says. First Peter, or Second Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, a servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have attained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't know if you caught that. Now, many people believe that Peter was the first pope. They he believed that he was the one that was church was built on. But it says here, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing. I've got an equal standing with Peter. That sorry rascal. <laughs> he was human too. But when we become in Christ, we're equal. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Notice verse 3. His divine power. See, here's the key. Here's the key for Malachi, the key for Peter, and the key for you. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in this world because of sinful desire. Let's drop down to verse 9, where it says, For whoever likes these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from the former sin. We need to remind ourselves as we sing this same song with a different verse, we win. Not through our labors, but through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. As Peter faced death. See, Peter knew that he was getting ready to die. You say, I don't remember reading that. But let's go down to verse 12. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that putting off of my body will be soon. Now, what does that mean in Oxford English? He was on croak, so, soon going to croak. He's going to die. He's going to put off this body. He knew it. This was at the beginning of the letter. He said, we can only make it as we put our faith and trust in God. The only way that we can be patient in waiting is to put our faith and trust in God. The only way that we can live a godly life is to put our faith and trust in God. The only way we're going to be delivered 
is put our faith and trust in God. He says, I know that putting off of my body will be soon as our Lord Jesus Christ made it clear to me. Jesus already said, you're soon going to be history. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. For we, here it is, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. So as Peter got ready to face death, he said, listen, I'm not telling you something that was a rumor. I'm not telling you something that somebody else told me. I'm telling you something that I was an eyewitness to. I know that this same Jesus that they crucified and we buried him and he rose from the dead. I know that he still lives and that he, because he lives, we too shall live. And I put my faith and trust in him even though I'm going to the grave. I know whom I have believed in. And Jesus loves me. Amen. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Church, I know people don't like to be reminded that we're going to be disciplined. We don't like to be reminded that we need to live a holy life. We don't like to be reminded that we need to give of our first fruits. We don't like to be reminded we need to be patient in our waiting. But the reality is a reminder that we all need but I'm glad that we will be delivered because greater is he that is within me than he is within the world. And today, as the worship team comes, we're going to sing that song that we learned as kids. Jesus loves me, this I know. And regardless of what's going on in your life, Regardless of what battle you've gone on, regardless of what failures you've had, can I tell you Jesus loves you? Can I also tell you that what you're going through may be a form of discipline for God to get your attention? You say, Pastor, you didn't have to say that. I know I didn't have to. But the truth is the truth. But in spite of all of our failures, in spite of all of our challenges, Jesus loves us. Amen. And we are more than conquerors. But I sense in my spirit that some today are trying to do it by yourself. Oh, you're trying hard. You're making a good effort. Can I tell you can I tell you how much those efforts are going to get you? Get you zilch. Because it's him. It's him. So as you prepare your hearts for communion today, I want you to be receptive to the Holy Spirit. Because he may be convicting you of one of those areas that we talked about. But let me assure you, there is deliverance, there is help, and there is strength, and there is the Holy Spirit. They promise to be with us, never leave us nor forsake us. On behalf of our pastor and staff here at OAG, we want to say thank you. Thank you for being a part of our ministry. We are grateful for you and the support you give our church and its ministries so that we can continue to do what God has called us to do, to be the family church for the family of God. For more content from Pastor Strickland and Oxford Assembly of God, check out our media website at oag.church/media.